welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. Today's question is, does the COVID context mean children are less safe right now? And I'm in conversation with Elizabeth Rose. Um, hi, my name is Elizabeth Rose. I'm an independent safeguarding advisor and trainer. Um, I started life working in school um, and I mainly work with schools now, but my safeguarding um, support spans from early years through schools, colleges and to universities as well. Um, and I'm, I also can support businesses and organisations. As well as this, I also work for a local authority. So I'm a safeguarding education advisor for a local authority in the West Midlands and I work there part time and then obviously have my um, consultancy work separate from that. Um, and as I said, I, uh, I started life as a teacher and I was a designated safeguarding lead. So I'm very much um, driven by wanting to improve conditions and outcomes for children um, and, and kind of affecting and supporting people who work in schools and, and the other organisation I've mentioned to, to kind of improve um, the lives of children and intervening if, if they are suffering any kind of abuse or neglect and, and supporting people to do that. And how did you end up uh, taking on that kind of safeguarding role originally and why did it kind of capture your imagination if you like? I think I always wanted to work in safeguarding and I did have some curriculum responsibilities actually um, when I was first a teacher um, but prior to being a teacher I worked as a teaching assistant and I worked with children to in, on a special project that improved their attendance and a lot of that was around supporting children who had very significant safeguarding issues and, um, and my interest began there really and so then I went into teaching trained to be a teacher and over the course of my career kind of developed my knowledge and understanding of safeguarding um, but I think the turning point came when I worked in Hackney and I was involved in setting up a I don't want to call it a pupil referral unit because that's not not what it was, but it was a, um, a sort of support unit that we had that was off site for children who were struggling with their behaviour. And again, there is often a, a very strong correlation between safeguarding and behaviour. Um, and and I, I was part of the team that helped to kind of set that up and work, worked in that um, in that area and worked down there with the students and that kind of ramped up almost my my wish and desire to work in safeguarding specifically um, so then my next role I was head of year and safeguarding lead um, at a different school and that they were both in London and then just through my personal circumstances I wanted to move back to the East Midlands I live in Leicestershire now and um, I so I applied for a job at the local authority in the West Midlands and wanted to support schools across the board really rather than working just within one school and I think that came about really because I wanted to having had experience of being a designated safeguarding lead myself it can be a very isolating position and it can be very difficult well it is very difficult and the things that you're dealing with are very challenging and I wanted to put in support in the local authority that I was working in to mean to kind of mitigate against some of the things that make it difficult I mean, the, the core that makes it that makes it challenging, but also makes it rewarding, is the the, the really challenging and, and shocking stories that you hear sometimes from, about children and, and the challenges that you know that they face when they go home um, or, or before they get home. Um, and uh, and I wanted to be a, to implement things that that could mitigate as much as possible um, against that for for DSLs across the board, really, and head teachers and schools. And how has the role of the um, designated safeguarding leads changed in the current context? So we're thinking today about the, the COVID context and how that's impacting on, on, on children and how safe they are. I mean, as you know, someone who kind of looks out for overseas supports designated safeguarding leads, what, what is their role looking like whilst kids have not been, you know, in, in school a lot of them? I think it's been really difficult because I think that weight of responsibility that people working within safeguarding and, and I don't I'm not just speaking for designated leads it's the whole team of learning mentors past, the pastoral team um, that, that work with children have had um, still have that weight of responsibility still know what's happening in children's lives but don't have that direct daily impact to make things better so yeah. the, the the kind of most worrying aspects are still there but the the feeling that you're actually able to make a difference has been removed 
in many cases. I mean, the, most schools in, in the country, across the country, have had vulnerable children in and working with them, and obviously key worker children as well. Or they've formed hubs together and they are sharing um, children across, across schools, I guess. Um, but, but, also, but the vast majority of children haven't been at school and a lot of vulnerable children haven't been at school. And I think as well, uh, it's the unknown. And as a safeguarding practitioner, your role is to, to know when or to identify when children are suffering abuse or harm um, or neglect. And, um, and you can't do that really if they're not in front of you it's very difficult to do that if they're not in front of you so that kind of thing that the sort of drive to make things better that people who work in the pastoral area have has been they've has been kind of removed but the risks are heightened for the children that's quite a toxic mix isn't it definitely and and it's kind of playing out in various different ways because children aren't having that face-to-face -face contact with schools so they're but the, as I say, the risk is not reducing and in fact it's increasing in many ways. So we've seen kind of the symptoms of this. Um, one of the symptoms is that the NSPCC have had a huge rise in calls um, for help for both domestic violence and for, for issues across the board. I think their calls have risen by a third um, during this crisis. And, and it's because, well I think it's because the that sort of face-to-face -face daily support that children have at school is, is has been removed for the, the vast majority of children and um and so they're turning which is a good thing they're turning to the NSPCC they're turning to, to sources of support but there's that huge tranche of, of children that may be suffering and may be vulnerable to suffering who who aren't turning to the NSPCC and they don't have those people who are looking out for them and I think I, I think a lot of the time, and it's certainly my experience, that is that you you notice that there's something happening for a child rather than them telling you the vast majority of the time. Yeah. And if a child's calling the NSPCC or if they're contacting you at school, they've reached a point where they're able to disclose what's happening to them. But there are lots of children who won't have reached that point where things are happening and you are unable to notice that that's happening because they're not there in front of you. So is it important at the moment that we are thinking about how to enable children to ask for help or is our role different to that? I think it's very much how we can enable children to ask for help and providing them with as much information about how they can do that as possible and as many different ways of doing that as possible that are all obviously suitable. Um, because I think it would take a lot to for a child to pick up the phone, potentially not their own phone, depending on the age of the child, ring their school um obviously we're in the summer holidays now so it's different again but um ring their school ask to speak to somebody know that that person's going to be there and is going to answer the call get to the point where they can say something they might be in the home the vast majority of children are that are abused or neglected are abused and neglected by somebody that they know or a family member mm -hmm. um you know get to this a place where they can be on the phone and disclose that to somebody in school um, there are just so many compounding factors and, and barriers to that happening. Um, and I think it takes a lot of creative thinking to remove some of those barriers, really, and to create opportunities for children to seek help. So what can help with that? Well, I've seen a number of things working well. So obviously, at all times that schools are open, and then there needs to be a safeguarding lead, either the designated lead or a deputy available. Um, and so sharing that information regularly with children. So having the standard things, like having things on your website, um, making sure that any newsletters that go home to, to um, parents contain safeguarding information. But actually having kind of clinics, DSL clinics, so you can phone this member of staff during this time and they will be available to answer to speak to you so setting some exact times for a child for children to call just removes all of those kind of um shall i ring at this time shall i not um who will i get to speak to it removes all of that for a child and so they just know i'm going to ring and i'm going to speak to that person um but there needs to be somebody there at all times because you know a child might not choose to do that they might choose to ring at a different time um, having an email address can work really well. So children can, can send an email to safeguarding at whatever the school is um, and then get an automated response with if this is an emergency, contact, use these contact numbers um, or, and then the, the safeguarding lead can ring them back and, and that's really helpful. Um, I think a, a huge issue is online safety and, it, and this has been just kind of exacerbated massively during this 
crisis. Um, so having information shared with children and families regularly about online safety as well as a pre preventative measure. So I think the preventative measures are, are incredibly important and it's important that we continue to push that kind of agenda as safeguarding professionals. Um, and just trying to keep lines of communication open. So we can't just rely on children contacting us when there's something wrong. We need to be regularly contacting children, vulnerable or not, because there are so many things that are happening with families that are making children vulnerable that weren't necessarily identified as that before. Um, so making sure that there is regular contact with all children so that we're going to them and we're providing them with an opportunity rather than them having to carve out time and you know, kind of come to terms with the fact that they've got to contact us. I think that's really important. So you said that the things that might make children vulnerable have, have changed, that looks a bit different now. Can you talk to me a bit about that? What's changed then? Yeah, I think, well, the number one thing is, is as we've talked about, the fact that children are not in front of professionals and don't have time away from environments that are potentially harmful in order to seek help. So that's kind of the, num the number one thing. Um, and that's just to, an, I think everybody uses the word unprecedented, but it is to an, an unprecedented level at the moment. Um, and now we've got this additional period of time where children would obviously be off school anyway during the summer. Um, I think the fact that children are spending so much more time online means that they are much more accessible to people who are perpetrators of harm, potential perpetrators of harm. Um, and the fact that in many cases, which is absolutely not anyone's fault, um, parents will be working and being expected to kind of work full time with their children doing online work um, or you know they need to look after their child or their children and do their work at the same time so children are having potentially more time unsupervised online just because of the nature of what's happening to everybody um, so I think that's a really significant risk I think that there's a danger that we think risk is reduced because children are at home and they're not in those you know they're not facing those contextual issues maybe to do with child exploitation gangs county lines etc um, but that's and that's a danger in itself that we think that risk is reduced when actually the you know, children suffer harm within, within their family homes and within their families and at the hands of people that they know far more than people that they don't know. Um, and, and I think just this idea of, of the, the impact of the lockdown itself. And we know that there's a, a kind of this idea of a trio of vulnerability. So children are more vulnerable if their parents have um, mental health issues, if they have drug or alcohol issues, um, or if there's domestic violence within the home. And those three things work together to increase vulnerabilities of children to all types of abuse. And all of those things are being impacted by the lockdown situation that we've been in and this kind of ongoing crisis. And if any of those things are challenging for a child it can mean that they are at a greater risk of harm um, and then we've got the, kind of the wider issues of, of we've seen a rise in hate crime for example because of the fact that people are looking for somebody to blame and there's been a rise in hate crime for some time but there's been a significant rise in hate crime recently against um, people from south and east asian backgrounds um, around this idea of who's to blame for what's happening and and there are it might not necessarily occur to, to, to people who don't work within safeguarding that actually that's a real risk to children because it, it kind of opens the door to dangerous conversations that might happen online, um, difficult, you know, dangerous thoughts and, and radicalization as well. So it's sort of all aspects really. Um, all aspects of safeguarding are being impacted by, by this crisis. Domestic violence is massively increasing. So I went, I had a, I went on a really interesting webinar um, that was provided for children's services in the local authority I, that I work with this week. And they were talking about the fact that it's quite a well-known um, awful statistic that two women a week in England and Wales are killed by the partner. And this has increased during lockdown to five women per week um, being killed by their partner. Um, so, you know, that domestic violence having a massive impact on young people and and it's just so prevalent so prevalent in in homes and the fact that increased pressure this being forced to be together um people are not able to work money is tight it's all kind of swirling together to to create really difficult environments for young people to work to, to live in um and it's all building up a picture of, of real risk and is the kind of the kind of racial unrest, does that have any relevance in safeguarding or not so much? Definitely. Um, and I think it's all as 
sort of part and parcel of the the risks around radicalization and extremism really and and it the the sort of there's various different aspects to this really so i'm just kind of thinking that through um i think the fact that we have this fake news situation i think at the moment so there's a lot of misinformation around covid19 itself um lots of kind of misconceptions that young people have around covid19 itself there's also this rhetoric of blame being used on social media a lot mm. um i read a study recently just going back to the this idea of misinformation about covid19 that the people who were most likely during the strict lockdown conditions most likely to break lockdown conditions uh, were people who got their news from youtube and facebook and people most likely to kind of to adhere to the rules were people who got who consume their news through mainstream media channels so i thought it was really interesting the the power of that mm. disinformation that people were getting um and i guess you might think why is this relevant to child safeguarding but actually it's it's sort of around trust and information and who's to blame and are our government protecting us and if children are having conversations with people online or within their family home around the government don't care about us um, and this is somebody else's fault. It can quite easily spiral into conspiracy theories, like the 5G is spreading COVID-19, for example. Um, it can kind of spiral in that, in that way. And then somebody looks for someone to blame. So if there's somebody online, a perpetrator online, who sees this happening, playing out on mainstream social media, they say, well, actually, it's this person's fault. It's that group. It's their fault because they're going out and doing this. Um, and it kind of works together to start that, potential radicalization process um, and I think this has happened obviously in tan, tan well it's not connected necessarily but it's happened in kind of parallel with the Black Lives Matter discussions that we've had and then there were the kind of riots protests slash riots the following weekend um, from the from the far right and the extreme far right in London and it's it's put it on the agenda in lots of different ways and it's talked about online very regularly by lots of different people mm. and um and young people are maybe consuming this and believing fake news or being drawn into conversations about whose fault it is because they're feeling isolated because they're feeling worried and they're feeling scared and they want to find answers um, and then they're not going to the place that is the supportive mechanism for educating them and allowing them to share views which they should be allowed to do when they're at school um, and ask questions and the misconceptions are not necessarily being addressed so although it seems like this kind of really big picture of all these different things happening around the world and how does this boil down to children being abused it's about that process of radicalization and it's about the dangers in opening that opening the door to Kind of having conversations where it's about blame and about about whose fault it is essentially wow it's a very complicated picture right now isn't it yeah it is <laughs> i hope i've explained that it kind of clear as clearly you, as I you have <laughs> i have to say that the, the thing it may, i just feel quite a lot of despair hearing all that and i i wonder <laughs> what then what to what what can we do you know people who are listening who have a, either a specific safeguarding role or just generally an interest in the well-being of children what, what do we do what is our role as adults right now to protect children it's about sharing the correct information i think and and using every method possible to to deploy the the correct information to children and support them in that and working with um other agencies that might be involved with children to, to make sure that, that they're doing the same and the messages being sent out are consistent. So as I say, you know, children would normally come in and they might have a, a PSHE um, session or they might have an assembly about Black Lives Matter or they might um, have a session in tutor time or form time. Um, but that's not happening. So actually, how can we share that information with children and families? Maybe it's around some of the curriculum work that they're being asked to do, um, some research, some um, you know, some resources that they're being provided with that can impart information that actually ultimately safeguards them is, is really helpful. Um, and maintaining, as I say, number one thing is maintaining that communication with young people as well. Um, and, and children, people can self-radicalise, um, but children are very vulnerable. Children are inherently vulnerable anyway because they're children. Um, but when they're online and they're unsupervised, um, 
and they're speaking to people that they don't know, that risk factor has obviously increased. So if we can put as many kind of barriers into them speaking to people that they don't know online um, and educating them around the risks and continuing to do that throughout this and building that into everything that we do in September when children come back um, in whatever form that might be, then I think they're the, they're the two factors really, communication and, and education and, and continuing that even when they're not in front of us. And you've talked quite a bit about the kind of the, the risks of online um, and you were speaking there specifically about kind of radicalisation, but there's there's kind of wider issues there, aren't there? You were talking um, earlier in the month about um, uh, criminal child exploitation, for example, and, and some of the, the, the risks there. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the risks online and again, what we might be able to do to mitigate those risks if that's any different than, than what you suggested? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so as, as I say, radicalisation is one aspect of it. Um, another incredibly worrying aspect of online safety at all times is child sexual exploitation and child sexual abuse. And that has been a major issue during COVID-19. Again, around the fact that children are more accessible online, but also perpetrators of abuse have more time to dedicate to um, grooming young people, connecting with and grooming young people. Um, and, and that obviously is incredibly dangerous. I think one study um, found that there's been 8.8 .8 million hits, or there was 8.8 .8 million hits on child sexual abuse, or URLs in, in, including, that, sorry, excuse me, URLs that contain child sexual abuse images in the first month or one of the first months of lockdown. Um, so there's just massive, there is just massive scope for children to suffer this type of abuse online and for perpetrators to access children. Um, so that's that's a huge risk and children are accessing or speaking to people that they don't know um, things like live streaming are becoming more common I mean we're obviously this is being recorded but we're live streaming now I don't know whether this would have happened necessarily or the training that I deliver would have happened in, in a live streaming way prior to lockdown it's becoming the norm um, and I have you know four or five meetings a day where I live stream that I would never have had before so that kind of idea that may have been built into curriculum um, around don't live stream, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. it just, it's not relevant anymore in the context that we're in. Um, so children are, are and do speak to people that they don't know online um, regularly. And live streaming is obviously a particularly dangerous aspect of this. Um, and I think, I think the, the kind of um, exploitation side of things as well, there's, well, children are as child sex exploitation is a, is a type of sexual abuse. Um, and there are just lots of different ways that children are at risk of this, I think, through this through online platforms. Um, so the, the coercion element to send um, indecent images of themselves is very um, common for children to do that. And in fact, I think it was a third of um, third of child sexual abuse images identified by the Internet Watch Foundation. I think in 2019 um, were self-generated indecent images of, of children. So they're being coerced and groomed into sharing images and then being blackmailed using those images. So, well, we'll send this to your family or we'll, send, we'll put it online if you don't send more. Um, and that sort of spiral of um, risk and things becoming more and more extreme is it's happening more because children are more accessible and, and spending more time online. So how do we protect them? Because as you say, we might have said in the past, well, don't live stream, it's dangerous. But, you know, my children today, one of them's had a science lesson and a trumpet lesson that's been live streamed. The other one's done a creative writing session that was live streamed with a tutor. And both of them have spoken to various friends online. And I wouldn't want them not to talk to their friends, but they're 10. And, you know, at what point does it go from their live streaming with a friend to, you know, something that we wouldn't want to happen is happening? Yeah, well, I think I think I would never have been a fan of don't live stream. It's dangerous. That that is not sufficient education for a young person to, to have, um, even prior to us using live streaming. But that is the reality of for lots of children. That is what's what they've that they've had. Um, obviously, not all children. You know, there there are, and I know there are hundreds of schools across the country that have amazing um, curriculum around online safety. But it's just raising that point really to consider it and consider how you've handled that before, how schools handled that before. Um, but, but it comes back to the education for parents, so the supervision and the appropriate controls and filters and, and that kind of thing, and actually understanding the risk. I think that, that 
I don't know whether everybody, and I, I wouldn't know this if I didn't work in safeguarding and I didn't um, hear this kind of thing all the time. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily know how quickly um, children can be drawn into things online. There was a BBC investigation a few years ago now where they, um, they asked her, she was an adult woman, but she looked quite young and they put her in a school uniform and she went on to the three kind of top live streaming websites and within 60 seconds she was receiving explicit messages requests for self indecent selfies um offers to send her indecent images um and and i don't know whether parents necessarily know that it can happen in 60 seconds um so i think what what we can do is it's around the education for children and it's around the education for parents as well so even if you are sitting in a room with your child you need, you know, and you're kind of doing your work, you need to be listening out for, for what's happening. You need to make sure that you know who they're speaking to and they know who they're, they're speaking to as well. Um, and it's not just, it's not just live streaming, it's things, you know, online gaming, um, chat kind of functions, things like Snapchat. Um, young people can quite easily add people that they don't know um, onto their Snapchat um, kind of contact list and connecting with people on various social media platforms. Uh, it's important that young people are taught in a sensitive way that mm. appreciates that they need to speak to their friends and they, they are young people and they want to find out, they want to use their phone and they want to go online. Um, mm. But equipping them with the skills to do so safely is, is really, really crucial. And I think it is particularly hard because I, I'm a parent who has in the past been quite strict about a lot of this stuff with my children but they are 10 and they really miss their friends and whereas you know there's online games that they play that in the past I've only allowed them to play privately and not to connect with their friends now that they can't see their friends it seems really cruel and wrong not to allow them to connect with their friends in those games but then it's difficult to know well you know how do you then stop other people talking to them and how do they know that the person who says he's their friend is their friend and it, it's very difficult isn't it it is difficult and i think that's one of the factors that's increasing risk to children at this time because actually people are families and parents are trying to support their children to continue to have a social life in incredibly difficult conditions mm. and and it is very challenging to do that and that is where the education and the conversations between the parent and child come in and also this idea of something that i find really challenging is when it's re the point is really driven home to children that it's illegal to do things. So it's illegal to send an, an explicit image of yourself, for example, which it is, but it doesn't foster that sort of feeling of being able to disclose or to seek help or to tell somebody if yeah. something has gone wrong. And actually a big, a big part of um, keeping children safe is encouraging children to be able to disclose and to speak freely to their parents about what's happened online or what they've seen. Um, and parents having that conversation with their children around you won't be in trouble you must come and tell me this is the kind of thing to look out for this is why you need to look out for that and this isn't secondary age children this is very this starts very young um, you know from as soon as children are using these platforms really um, these conversations need to start happening in an age appropriate way around being approachable and being able to take kind of discl disclosures for want of a better word but discuss with your child if they've seen something that's upset them or has been difficult for them so a really important thing is just to make sure that they know that they can come and ask for help if something goes wrong or they see something upsetting or they're not sure about something yeah yeah definitely and also pointing them as well to if they don't want to speak to you as a parent where else can they go for help where you know it's safe and reliable um, so CEOPS, for example, the Child Exploitation Online Protection Command, um, that's a really useful website for young people to report something if, they, if they've if they experienced something upsetting or bullying or any kind of abuse online. Um, it, it is important, I should also mention, and I should have said this before, that sometimes children won't know that this is happening to them. So grooming, obviously, is very, is an insidious way of getting children, coercing children to do things without them necessarily realising that they're being abused. Um, so having that conversation with children about, well, what is grooming? What does that look like? How will this start? What will people be saying to you? Um, that's really important too, as well as come and tell me if something's upset you. These are, you also need to have that conversation around, well, what about if somebody says this to you? What would you do? What would you think if somebody said that to you? Um, and, and educating them around the risks of grooming as well. 
So what kind of things would we be telling them to look out for? People who are trying to be their friend that, that they don't know. Um, people who are asking them not to tell anybody things that they've asked them or, or spoke to them or it's a kind of secret or that kind of thing. Um, promising them things or saying, well, when we meet up, I'll give you this. Um, I, you might be familiar, um, or the people listening to this might be familiar with the story of Breck Bednar, um, whose mum is really, really, really um, vocal in promoting safety and online safety now and, and um, in response to what happened to him. And he was groomed online uh, through an online gaming platform. And it was all about careers. So, this, so the person who's grooming him said that he worked for a, an IT company and was a programmer. And it was, you know, this kind of great future um, was offered. And it wasn't, it, it didn't have the kind of stereotypical um, aspects of grooming that maybe you might think of. Um, and, and so it's around thinking, well, how is somebody going to try and befriend you? And how might they do that? And what kind of things might they say? And why is that a problem? And what should families do if they kind of, you know, perhaps they created this good environment at home and a child does say, I think this, this, you know, that there's this relationship I'm a bit uncomfortable about. Someone's wanting to make friends with me or offering me things or, you know, some of those things that you said, what, what should you do next? You need, you need to report it. So I think a, a kind of knee, knee jerk reaction and a completely understandable one um, from a parent's perspective. And I'm, I'm a parent as well. I've got a daughter that she's only 17 months at the minute. So we're not quite onto that this stage just yet. Um, but uh, a, a sort of immediate reaction is, well, I'm going to take the phone, I'm going to take the laptop, I'm going to block this person and that will be the end of it. But that's not the end of it because your child might not be the only victim um, and it's likely not, not to be the only victim. And there are, there are other ways that people who want to contact children can get in contact with them. And just because they're blocked on one platform, it doesn't mean to say that they can't access your child in another way and, and actually firstly your the safeguarding leads within school are outstanding sources of support for families for this kind of thing so um, they will all have had training to safeguard children they will all, all have training to safeguard them in terms of online safety um, so going to to the school if your child is at a school um, and speaking to them about that is a really good good thing to do um, you can always ring well, 999 if it's an emergency or 101 if it's not an emergency, but to, to speak to, to the police and report a crime. And you can go through the CEOPS, um, which is a, an online portal for uh, reporting online exploitation of young people as well. So I would urge people to report it wider than just taking action for your child. Um, it's really important to report it and have that go through the proper channels as well. And how do you support a child who's kind of had that experience? Again, would you, you sort of suggest that people talk to the safeguarding lead at school or is there particular things that we would do to follow up and, and kind of protect them from future harm? Or Yeah, I mean, the, the, any child it can be vulnerable to this. So some, some children obviously have additional vulnerabilities that, that make them more susceptible to this kind of abuse. So if a child has... Um, SEND, for example, special education needs and disabilities, if they are... Um, living in a kind of residential care where they're a looked after child they might have more more vulnerabilities there are lots of different things that make children more vulnerable um but any child can be a, be a victim of grooming and online online abuse so i think it's about making sure that that child is obviously reassured that they haven't done anything wrong that this is something that they're that's happened to them by somebody who's done the wrong thing um, and then and then listening to them and supporting them and lots of schools will, will implement or have um, access to counsellors, for example, and kind of that that support around coming to terms with the trauma of what's actually happened. Um, if something if it's got to that stage um, and then and then really, really robust education. So it's not just about responding to this has happened and we'll put in support for this incident. It's about thinking through, well, how are we going to stop this happening again? How are we going to involve the parents? Are we going to involve any other agencies in protecting this child? How are we going to get the child on board with, with kind of protective behaviours and staying safe from this point forward? Um, and having that package of support around a child is, is really important. Who's in the kind of wider family network that can support with this as well? And so we've talked quite a lot about oh, the gloom and doom about uh, COVID <laughs> and how there are kind of increased risks for children right now and it's maybe harder to, to access and support. But is there anything about the current context which is kind of cause for hope? Have you seen any 
good new practice or ways in which children have been kept more safe or things are better? I think different children and different families have reacted in completely different ways. So some children who are have, who struggle with kind of school avoidance or um, are, have real issues with their attendance, actually there's been loads of really good things that have happened for those children that mean that they're more included within the school community. So the online learning is working really well for them and they're actually having much more contact with people in school than they ever did before um, because of the fact that their attendance was, was low prior to this, this lockdown. And uh, there's been a lot of talk about blended learning and how we're going to incorporate the, the kind of teaching that's been happening during the period of lockdown when children come back in September or you know, some children might come back we're not sure exactly what that will look like I guess um, but how we can continue to use that for children who are either in hospital or they are struggling with their mental health and well-being and they're unable to come to school or you know any of those reasons why they're not attending um, and, in, and making sure that we kind of include that and think of that going forward it's opened up um, doors to to different ways of working I think um, in order to reach children that we weren't necessarily reaching before which I think has been a really a really positive thing. And how about how we reach those who work with them as well because obviously we've been working together looking at um, kind of providing safeguarding training online in, in new ways than certainly than we've done as an organisation before and we had that first session that you ran for us where we had three and a half thousand people who wanted to come and yeah. you know whilst we did limit that session um, the idea that you could reach that kind of number of people that quickly with a really topical issue was I thought quite exciting. Mm. Well definitely I, and I think before the advent of the kind of live streaming training it was very much contained in, in much smaller groups and um, throughout the year so therefore potentially less responsive to what was happening in, in the context that we've got um, and and yeah definitely as you say reach fewer people um, and I think that what people need who work in safeguarding is they need up to the minute information about what the risks to children are right now and what to do about it and I think or I hope that's why the session that we ran before was so popular because people wanted to know well, what's happening for the children that we work with when they're not in front of us, what are the risks to them? Um, and, and kind of that, that up to the minute content, I think is really important. Um, we do have, safeguarding leads have to have refresher training every two years, but they also have to keep on top of developments as they, as they come up as well. And, and I think that the, that live streaming training and opening it up to a, a bigger audience in the way that we did in the way that you do with your training I think will have a massive impact on the numbers we can reach and therefore the number of children that we can protect um, and when I plan training I always I always keep the children in mind so what you know if this was my child and they were suffering this type of abuse um, what do I want their teachers and what do I want their safeguarding needs to know to make a difference to them and I always think about that when I'm planning training and when I'm when I'm um, standing in front of people delivering training or sitting at my computer now and delivering training. And, and I think that 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 the, the amount of reach and the, the kind of wide net that we can cast with with doing training online will mean that that those children are better protected. And that's my aim. And we've had quite a lot of discussions about wanting to sounds a bit trite but wanting to kind of revolutionize really I guess how safeguarding training happens and um, I've been excited to work with you on this because I think we both kind of want similar things here but I have this view that safeguarding training and child protection training for many years it's it, it is a box that has to be ticked isn't it and that sometimes it can become a bit procedural and what we really want is to genuinely empower people to act and to keep children safe. Um, and so we've been thinking together about how do we take training from just being what has to be done to something that people kind of engage with in a meaningful way. And how can you know what can you talk a little bit about how you think you make that happen? Because that's why we're working together, isn't it? It's because that's your belief, too, that, that it needs to, to impact. Yeah, I think a range of ways of delivery, I think, is a, is a good start because you need to appeal to the fact that people who work in schools at any level are incredibly busy all the time. And I, I am talking mainly about schools because that is the bulk of my of the work that I do. Um, and, and actually, 
going out on a whole day's training every two years is exactly what people need to do to come out of their context, speak to other professionals, learn. And that's really important. That's a really key cornerstone, I think, of safeguarding practice and training. But also sometimes you just need a 15 minute video that you can watch when you want to. So a kind of on demand type type video because you um, want to just refresh your memory about something or you just need to find out a little bit more about a topic that wasn't covered in your refresher training or you've had a, an issue raised about something that maybe you feel a little bit less confident about and you just need to, to access that training there and then and, and it to be ready. And that's the kind of thinking that I've had when I've been recording some of the on demand training that we've we've been working on together um, what is it that people need in that moment the key information um, about safeguarding issues and then sometimes we'll have an issue like you know, or we'll have a, a situation like we've had with covid i mean it's, a, it's an extreme example but or there will be something happening in the country nationally or even globally where there needs to be something very responsive so the the kind of live shorter sessions packed full of information are really important in kind of responding immediately to, to to what's happening um, and I think also obviously a safeguarding leads listening will know there is a huge weight of responsibility on them for training the rest of their staff mm. and um, and you can't you can't safeguard in isolation you need all of your staff to be, to be the eyes and ears and be looking at, at what's happening for children um, from the minute they arrive to the minute they go home and also talking to them about everything that happens after they go home as well and so training staff throughout the year and making sure that they've got everything that they need constantly drip fed to make sure that it's always on the agenda is a kind of is the other section really of, of safeguarding or one of the other sections of safeguarding training um, as well that I'm kind of keen to to develop through the on demand courses or, or in various ways. I mean, we're in we're kind of in discussion, I guess, about lots of different ways of of safeguarding people and, and I am always open to the suggestions of what people need I think there's nothing worse than kind of thinking well I know what people need and I'm going to do this it's much better to ask them what they need and then tailor something to, to them um, and I think that's what we do really in, in working together um, and I hope that's what I do in my training practice more widely um, and and it kind of comes back to what I said at the beginning really about my the reason why I want to work in why I am a safeguarding advisor both for the local authority and, and independently. Um, and it's about doing everything I can to make it easier for those frontline practitioners to safeguard children to ultimately improve outcomes for children. And, um, and actually training is, is a big part of that for them and supporting them in that, the workload, I think, around thinking through and implementing training for everybody else. And you said before, which I think is really important to acknowledge that when you are a safeguarding lead there is a huge weight of responsibility on you you feel that really keenly and that can be quite a burden to carry actually can't it um the stakes are really high so what's your advice to people who are in that role about how they kind of look after themselves as well because i worry about that quite a lot mm, i do as well and and i worry about it because people often tell me how how difficult it is and and I run, as part of my local authority role, I run DSL briefings and often I will have people stay behind at the end just to have a little chat about something that they've been managing or a question that they've got. And sometimes it's just reassurance of, um, did I do the right thing here? And, and actually, safeguarding leads need somebody to talk to that is approachable, neutral and experienced and has that level of expertise in order to be able to support them. And I think safeguarding supervision has been a huge conversation recently for education because it's not something that has been um, has ever been statutory and it's still not not statutory for for anybody other than early years. And it was in the draft. Is it not? I thought it was. Uh, no, no, it's not. It was in the um, the consul. Sorry, the consultation, not the draft copy. It was in the consultation document for keeping children safe 2020. Um, that it was in the role of the DSL, and then it was taken out of the. The, um, the one that's come forward is the draft. So oh, I didn't realise. See, I'd read in the draft and just assumed because it doesn't usually change significantly, does it? Oh, God. It, well, this this one did change. And I think it's because of the co the COVID context. Um, but but it has been taken out. So it's a, it's, to, it's a support rather than supervision. Um, but it is in the inspection framework. So it's in the inspection framework for um, early years and education settings. So it, it's mentioned there and it says that effective safeguarding arrangements include supervision. Um, but I think supervision, because supervision is so, so new for schools, 
the kind of supervision that schools need is still developing and, uh, and the kind of support that, that practitioners in schools need and the number of people in schools that need that support is just huge. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's a, a very kind of big conversation about how we can do that and how we can implement that um, to make sure that, that designated safe body needs are supported and that they have that, that opportunity to speak to and have somebody as a kind of sounding board, but also have that reflective kind of integrated supervision session, which is just theirs and their specific time that they can talk about um, what's happening. But also it needs to involve that case oversight. So it's got to be, as well as the support, it's also got to be around keeping at the heart of it, the safeguarding of the child, but the mental well-being of the member of staff and the kind of health and, um, and sort of support for the member of staff, but also what impact is this having on the child? How can we take your concerns or take the work that you've been doing and, and how can we kind of support the young person that you're telling me about as well? Um, it's kind of part and parcel of the same, same thing, really. And do you provide that kind of input in your local authority role? Is that something that happens locally for you? Yeah, so that's something that is um, that we're working on actually, and we're going to. I'm going to provide train the trainer supervision um, across the local authority for um, for people to to learn how to do that essentially in their setting and support their staff. But it is difficult because lots of the time a safeguarding lead will be a head teacher, um, mm -hmm. and and they will then come on the train the trainer um, uh, to support the rest of their staff, but they need to be supported themselves. Um, and that's where I think the role of external supervision comes in. And there's lots of really amazing work going on with external supervision um, across the country and, and supervision and education across the country. And, um, and I, I'm excited to see where that goes really. Yeah, and I think we can think about how we can support and, and help with that as well. Do you think supervision has to happen face to face or do you think it is possible for that to happen safely online? I think it needs to happen face to face to start with. Um, I think if, if I was supervising someone, I would find it very difficult to um, form that meaningful relationship with them, having just met them online. Mm. And I think it's also really important to understand their context as well and go to them. And, and I'm talking specifically for supervision for education here. Um, you know, go, go to where they're working and when they're speaking to you, understand the context that they're in. I think, I think for me as a supervisor, that would be very impor important. Um, and then I think, you know, it's, once you've done that work and you have that existing relationship, then yeah, on, online is, is um, an option. But I think the groundwork needs to be done in person. Yeah, that's a big ask then, actually, isn't it? That's a, it's a big undertaking. And it's who, a big undertaking. What, how do you look after yourself? So you end up supervising those who are leading and then who looks after you? Well, it's a good question, really. I think... Um, I think I have a support network within the organisation that I work with in my local authority role, and I'm very well supported in that. Um, and, and then, I guess, through conversations that I have with, with kind of peers and, and with safeguarding, you know, with, with all of the people that I work with, I think, it's, I think safeguarding is a very difficult arena to work in, but I think practitioners who work in it are very supportive of each other as well um, within education, and I think... Um, I think that's really helpful. And I think that sets a good ground level really for this implementation of supervision um, because of the fact that people want to support each other. Mm. I hope that they do. Um, and, uh, but, but yeah, I think, I guess it's, it comes through my local authority role and the support that I get from my colleagues there. But you are right. I think it's, it's something that highlights, um, that highlights that there is a, a dearth in, in this area, I guess, at this point. Um, and, and I think it will, I think, over, and I hope over the next few years, it will really kind of ramp up and, and people who work in this area will have access to, to high quality supervision as well. And have you found that becoming a mum and having your own daughter, has that made your job harder? Has it made it more kind of real? It's quite a leading question that I, I, <laughs> I found that my work's much harder now. It feels a lot more real. I have my own girls. Um, yeah, I think, I think I would agree with you. And I'm hesitating there because I don't want to come across as saying that you don't understand unless you've got mm -hmm. a child. I definitely do not believe that. Um, but I do think that there is, you can't help sometimes but have that, well, what if this, you always think as a safeguarding practitioner, what if this was my child? Because you have the child's best interests at heart and you think, what, what is the best for this child? And what can I do that's the best for this child? I think when you have your own child, 
there's an actual concrete child that you're thinking about yeah. there. And that's, and that's the difference. <clears throat> and that's, and I have found that. And I have found that, um, you know, some of the research that I've done and some of the, you do, I mean, as, a, as an advisor, you do extensive research um, constantly really about, about what's happening in the world of safeguarding and serious case reviews, serious practice reviews. And I do think that the way I approach them and the way I think about them is slightly different to the way that I did before. Not in terms of the output, so the output and how I communicate it to people is the same, but I think the kind of maybe the emotional impact on me is different. Yeah, so you have to perhaps look after yourself a little bit more. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And, and that's why I, I think I enjoy the kind of tandem working of working independently and having a, a structured place of work, which is within children's services, because I have that, that support network. And I think it's difficult if you're working completely on your own in that in terms of your own emotional needs and you never thought that maybe a more cheerful line of work might <laughs> <laughs> I feel really passionate about safeguarding I really do and I think it, it, it's just so crucial and it's so crucial to have people in the arena that are passionate about it because you when you say you're passionate about safeguarding what you actually mean is you're passionate about keeping children safe and I don't think it's a bad thing that things emotionally affect you um, as long as you're able to manage that, obviously. And it's, it's to the benefit of the children, ultimately, that your work is reaching. And, um, and I think that that, that's, that drives everything that I do. So although it's challenging, although it's difficult, um, ultimately, it's making a positive difference and it's doing the right thing um, and intervening when children need help. And there's nothing, you know, for me, there would be nothing more rewarding um, than that. I've heard it said before that the point at which this kind of work stops emotionally impacting on you is the point when you should stop. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I definitely do agree with that. Um, because then, and actually at that point, I think that's where an individual would really need some supervision because it's, you've become desensitized. And if you've become completely desensitized, then you're not, you're not responding necessarily, or you're not able to respond potentially in the way that that's the most effective. Um, I always say in, in my training, um, and I think sometimes people have to take a second to think about what I mean, but when people start to say, well, I know everything about safeguarding means that they don't know anything about safeguarding. <laughs> you know, it kind of, it gets to that point and, and you can be as experienced as anybody, you know, you can have worked in safeguarding for so many years, but there will always be something that happens that you, that is unexpected. And in fact, we use that phrase all the time, expect the unexpected. Um, and actually, if you're getting to a situation where either you're emotionally desensitized or, or where you think, well, I've, se I've seen everything now, you're not open to uh, spotting new risks or, or new challenges. And I think it's always important to challenge your um, kind of conceptions of yourself almost and, and to challenge, well, am I thinking of everything? Am I thinking of every angle here? What could I have missed? Um, is, is really, really important. So it's a slightly different thing to, it's a slightly different point, I guess, what I say in training to, to the question that you asked, but, but I think it's the same sort of idea that you need to remain emotionally responsive and you need to always be thinking, have, what else can I do? What else can I learn about? What else is going to happen? Um, because only then are you tr remaining kind of with your finger on the pulse, really, and able to safeguard children in the issues that are coming up for them. It's it's a challenge, isn't it? Because it is such a big responsibility. And although, you know, we think often about our, our safeguarding leads and those with a specific responsibility, actually, this is the responsibility of every single person working with or supporting children, isn't it? And then we look at it in this current context and how it's changing, the risk that children are facing. It's, I mean, it's a lot, isn't it? It's hard to know how, how best to, to help um, and make a difference. It is. And I also think um, that raises a really good point about uh, safeguarding is everyone's responsibility. Um, and it's also important to think about when you go back um, to school, or obviously you've been there all along, <laughs> people have been there all along, but when things return in September, um, the kind of issues that your staff will have faced during lockdown. So thinking about the training that you deliver in September, how you're going to talk about children might have experienced domestic violence or mental health issues or drug and alcohol abuse when actually the people sitting in front of you in that training might also have experienced some of those things so thinking about their emotional needs as well and you need them to be prepared with all of the information to safeguard children when they come back 
and there is expected to be a huge influx in referrals um, for children going into social care when children come back to school fully in September. Um, but also thinking about your staff and what might have happened to them and how you're going to phrase training for them is really important because you don't know what kind of experiences they've had as well. Yeah. I always tell people to imagine that front and centre is someone who has got direct living experience of whatever it is we're teaching about and that if you keep them safe, you keep everyone safe. But I don't know if you have any other ideas that kind of add to that. I think that that summarises it really um, exactly. Just thinking, and that is difficult when you're delivering an annual refresher that has a huge amount of content in it mm. and you are trying to boil it down into a certain period of time. Um, but, but kind of on that, that's where the, this idea of the drip feeding comes in. You know, you don't, it's, it's more effective to cover what you need them to, to know to safeguard children that day. And, you know, what's the, what's the key information that you need them to take away from that session. But then next week we'll do something with a bit more time on this issue or that issue and doing it throughout the year means that you have time to think through what you've just said about, you know, how am I going to pre present this? And it's not just a kind of rushed here's a slide on domestic violence, here's a slide on unabased abuse. And, um, and it's kind of thought through and spread out a bit more, I think is more effective. Yeah, and hopefully that's where the, the on-demand training that you're kind of filming for us at the moment will really help because people will be able to go away and digest that at their own pace, won't they? And uh, hopefully take it on board over a period of time rather than having to do it all in one, in one hit. Yeah, definitely. And I've designed those in order for them to be applicable to, to all members of staff. Um, but also with sufficient detail for a safeguarding specialist to refresh their knowledge and to, to learn something new. Um, so, so they would be really useful to have people watch um, maybe during the course of a week and then you do a shorter training session answering questions or doing a kind of Q&A. And I know we've talked about the, the potential for, for us doing a, a kind of Q&A following some of those on demands as well. Um, but kind of using them to give yourself more time and space really to explore issues in more detail um, because they have that kind of flexible element of people watching them at different times and you don't have to again as the safeguarding lead stand in front of everybody and tell everybody uh, run through kind of a list of slides about um, a particular issue you've got a, a toolbox really um, to to appeal to to different members of staff and to be accessed at different times and watch this space i'm really excited about it <laughs> i don't know if that's, if that's sad or not but i am really excited <laughs> um, what thought would you like to leave people with what thought would you like to close with um i think the most important thing um that i've said i guess in the discussion or that we've talked about in the discussion today is about lines of communication for young people and having lines of communication with them open whether they're in front of you or whether they're at home and no matter what issue we've talked about or what issue has happened for children that we may or may not know about. We need to be a constant, as safeguarding professionals, we need to be a constant in their lives. They need to know that they can come and tell us and that they will have an appropriate response to them. Um, and we need to give them opportunity to do that. So when they come back in um, September after the holidays, don't assume that they can, rem that they remember that they can talk to anybody about their concerns or this member of staff is helpful for this thing. Um, to induct them again so as part of your your kind of processes for getting children back into school make sure that that safeguarding is on that induction and, and what you need to what you can do if you need to seek help or if something's happened to you over the course of lockdown um, and then if children if we're in a situation where there are children not at school um, then it's about making sure that you're contacting them and and having those you are taking responsibility for those lines of communication rather than putting that onto the child to seek help if they need to I think that's that's what I want people to take away as the kind of most important point really um, for safeguarding during this time. Mm -hmm.